Good morning. Welcome to our Baha for worship. We come together to share in worship as four Unitarian Universalist congregations across Southeast Arizona because we know that we are stronger together. We represent Borderlands Unitarian Universalist, Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist Congregation, Sky Island Unitarian Universalist Church, and the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson. Last week, we heard Reverend Bethany speak about the salvation from quarantine that many of us are anticipating or enjoying in the form of vaccination. And she also spoke about the long journey ahead to our collective liberation from this particular struggle. There are many people still awaiting vaccination, and there are many people for whom there is no approved vaccination currently. So this week, we're going to talk some about some of the practices that sustain us on the journey and some of the learning that we have gathered already and the way we can take those lessons forward with us. In that light, I want to open with a chalice lighting from a year ago. If you can remember the feeling when everything was so new and so overwhelming and just acknowledge and integrate the fact that we have learned and traversed a great distance. This reading comes from UU Reverend Alice Anacheka Nasaman and is called Grounding in Our Faith. In a time of uncertainty, when everything around us is changing constantly, each day new developments, rising numbers, changing guidelines, when the world we live in suddenly seems upside down and topsy-turvy. We light our chalice to remind ourselves of our grounding in our faith. We remember that the flaming chalice came into being as a beacon of hope during World War II, a secret symbol that offered help. In the midst of it all, we wrap ourselves in the warm light of a familiar flame, a reminder of the strength that emerges when we come together in community. We acknowledge, as we do each week, that this land that many of us live on was stolen from indigenous peoples. In what is now called Southern Arizona, the displacement, genocide, and theft of land occurred in successive waves of colonization by Spain, Mexico, and the United States. And this colonization is still happening today. The Chiricahua Apache, Pasquayaki, Otham, and Opata peoples are the indigenous ancestors of this land and our neighbors today. They are each unique in their culture and language. They are each resilient in their maintenance of traditional life ways, which also engage the present and shape the future. Sing of the prophets of Jesus. 
Once upon a time, there was a tiny, little, itty-bitty, very small, tiny little god named Tiny. She lived her life hearing stories of all the big gods, and, well, let's face it, she was jealous. She knew she needed to think of some kind of special spark of an idea that would make her existence meaningful. After watching humans for a long time, she hit upon something that just might work, something to make people think, yeah, that tiny has really got a good idea going. This was it. This was going to make her famous. Ready? Here it is. You are not alone. She took the form of a very light breeze and a voice so quiet each person heard it only in their mind. She said, you are not alone. You are not alone. People loved it. It was perfect because who doesn't want to hear that? Pretty soon, Tiny was comforting people all over with, you are not alone. Every evening, she took the form of a breeze and whispered it in people's minds. Until one day, she encountered someone who wasn't comforted at all. When Miriam heard Tiny's words in her mind, instead of feeling comforted, she felt agitated. Something was just kind of off about it. She kept saying it to herself over and over again, you are not alone. You are not alone. She tossed and she turned. She couldn't sleep. In the morning, she went to read the paper, and instead of skimming everything, she found herself drinking in every single story. She was only halfway through when she found herself crying. I am not alone, she said. I am connected to every one of these people. They live in my town and my country and my world. They love their children like I love mine. They're scared sometimes, and so am I. They hurt like I hurt. I am not alone. I can help. Tiny was surprised. It hadn't occurred to her that someone might think of it that way. Tiny kept watch over Miriam to monitor this interesting development. Miriam and a coworker met online in a meeting and talked about a law they hoped the Senate would pass, and Tiny noticed when Miriam wrote a letter to her senator about it right away. She noticed that when Miriam turned in her grocery order, she brought a, bought a few extra things for her neighbor and left them with a colorful note on their porch. She noticed that Miriam had tears in her eyes when she joined in her congregation's worship on her computer, and she learned her favorite hymn through the small speakers. Miriam got out her phone and made an extra donation to her congregation. She watched as Miriam wrote postcards to friends and family near and far, waved to the dog walkers who passed by her house and strung up colorful lights in her living room window. But most importantly for Tiny, she noticed when Miriam received a phone call one evening from a friend she hadn't heard from in a long while. His voice was shaking. I'm having a hard time, he said. He started to tell her about his troubles, but he began to cry. Miriam got herself comfortable in her favorite chair. Take your time. I'll stay on the line with you. You are not alone. I am here, she said. I am here. Tiny heard those words like an echo in her mind. You are not alone. I am here. You are not alone. I am here. In that moment, Tiny knew that she was nothing without Miriam's hands and heart and spirit. And she knew what she wanted, what the world needed more than anything, was what Miriam had learned to give. So Tiny went to work. Instead of just spending her evening spreading the gospel of you are not alone, she spent her night times doing it too, and her mornings and afternoons. Pretty soon, she was spending every moment doing it until she became the breeze itself. And that is why there are no paintings of Tiny, no busts or holy books, just a breeze, a low voice, and many, many helping hands, loving hearts, and caring spirits. You can hear the echo if you listen closely. You are not alone. I am here. smile how 
man can lift How far is far enough to give Is there a way to learn Just how a kindness speaks Or where it goes Should love be caught Our reading today comes pre from H.P. Rivers. It's titled, Prayers Whispering to Each Other. And a note, because there's something that you cannot see, but you'll only hear, that H.P. uses the term God, G-O-D-D-E, a Middle English spelling of the word God, to encompass the goddess-like and God-like natures of the divine, which H.P. believes to be genderless, and greater than any name we could give them. In writing, it is G-O-D-D-E. They write. I open my Facebook feed to yet another tragedy, another beloved in pain, another hug so desperately needed that I cannot give or receive. They all seem to be piling up these days. I light a candle, then snap a quick photo. For you and your family, I text. I love you and I'm thankful for you. The part of me that is still a Catholic they write by heritage can't stop lighting candles. The part that is pagan uses them to cast spells and set intentions. The part that is human is learning that sometimes all we can do is bear witness. I cannot always change the pain of the world, but I can acknowledge it. I can set a candle on my desk and remind myself that there is suffering dancing in the flame. I can send a photo to a friend, to a group chat, to a mother of a child in the hospital to say, I cannot lessen your pain, but I can sit with it with you, even from a distance. The heat of it fills my chest with a love that is too big to be only mine, profound enough to be godly. The precariousness of it, contained now in a jar or a candle, but capable of escaping to cause destruction at any time, reminds me that tomorrow it could be someone I love lighting a candle for me. Sometimes there is no reprieve from the pain of the world. Sometimes it is too big and too obvious to ignore. My grandfather did not take me to church to change the world. He took me to the church to light a candle. 
At six years old, all toothless grins and sidewalk chalk, he brushed my forehead with holy water and told me about this little rose of prayers side by side, whispering to each other and to God. At 17, he sent me to the Vatican and said, light a candle for the family. I light candles for my family, the family that knows no form, no patriarchy, no mothers or fathers or leaders or sheep. My family of spirit, my family of love, my family of tears and sweat and healing and grace, dancing together in the flame towards a brighter tomorrow. God, embrace this family of carbon and stardust dancing and praying our way through the universe, witnessing one another, and with every holy sunrise, committing to loving one another through the pain. Blessed be. Here in Arizona, many people are getting easier access to vaccination against COVID-19. It is celebratory and hopeful to imagine this near future where we will be able to gather in person or have our social practices as we are accustomed to. I think that this, this moment is a great upwelling of hopefulness that reminds us of how good it feels to have a vision that we are working towards together. And even as we have spoken of in these worship spaces, there is still a journey ahead of us that hope is one of the forces that helps us continue with that journey. It may feel magnetic pulling us forward or it may feel supportive carrying us when times are hard. And this spiritual practice of hope is absolutely necessary. But I also want to speak about this other practice that we have collectively strengthened in the last year, which is the spiritual practice of disappointment. It might sound not spiritual to talk about things that are hard, but in fact it is truly a community building activity and an affirming part of life. Thomas Merton said, Indeed, the truth that many people never understand until it is too late is that the more you try to avoid suffering, the more you suffer, because smaller and more insignificant things begin to torture you in proportion to your fear of being hurt. The one who does most to avoid suffering is, in the end, the one who suffers the most. In this, we get the invitation to let go of our small sufferings in order to strengthen ourselves. Joanna Macy has a similar message. She says, the refusal to feel takes a heavy toll. Not only is there an impoverishment of our emotional and sensory life, flowers are dimmer and less fragrant, our loves less ecstatic, but this psychic numbing also impedes our capacity to process and respond to information. The energy expended in pushing down despair is diverted from more creative uses, depleting the resilience and imagination needed for fresh visions and strategies. We know that we are living in a difficult world. And even as we are in this journey of hope, it's certain that we will continue to face other disappointments. 
So this spiritual practice that we have gotten to engage collectively on such a large scale is something that will serve us going forward. If we imagine hope like the tightrope that carries us across a chasm, we can imagine despair as the ability to get off the tightrope and descend into that space, into that in-between place, between our goals, not quite where we want to be, and to know that that in-between place is also a place where we live and we grow and we learn. And when we're on the tightrope, it feels good to continue forward. We have momentum and hope towards the destination on the other side. But if we are only traveling in fear, it makes it harder to balance. So what is it to get off of the tightrope and to trust that you'll be able to get back on? For many of us, myself included, I was taught this social custom, this rule, that it's better not to talk about hard things. It's not for polite company. It's best to focus on upbeat things and to say polite, happy things. Sometimes this is socially functional. It's not always the right moment to enter into conflict with someone, but it's often deceptive if we only say nice things about ourselves and we only say our life is going well and we struggle to talk about the really hard things, then sometimes when we are in a moment where we need support with something hard, we might not know who to turn to. We might feel like it's not okay for something to be hard. But what we know is that it is a normal part of life to experience despair and disappointment and frustration and everything that is below the tightrope is a part of our community at any given moment. And in this last year, we've gotten to, on a collective scale, express our disappointment. So many people last spring and summer were naming the loss of a future that they thought they were going to have. We've also experienced the real sadness of loss of community members. And the more we can come together around these things that are hard, the more we make space for ourselves to support each other with our individual struggles and disappointments. A community is a group of people who are in touch with each other. And it is good to have people who are on the tightrope and it is good to have people who are down in the space in between and it isn't actually the job of community to pull everyone up onto the tightrope. It's just the job of the community to stay in touch with each other. So we know that the people who are descended, maybe they took a ladder down, maybe they dropped off of the rope, however they journeyed, that they're still in touch with people on the tightrope. And we know that we will, through time, each be in a different place and the more we have community to turn towards each other, the more we can trust that when we are not on the tightrope, someone will be up there to tell us how to get back. And through time and patience, we will each be trading places and each be offering each other our skills. That is the beauty of staying together and supporting each other. We are learning like Miriam, to say, you're not alone. I'm here with you. Even when you are having a hard time, that's okay. I honor that. You are fine how you are, and I'm here with you. And we are learning practices. And many of us already have these practices. Perhaps you light a candle. Perhaps you send a card. And I love both of these practices because I, I send a card for happy things and I send a card for hard things. There really is an expression through the candle and the card and so many other forms of just holding each other in life, just acknowledging each other, staying in touch. 
And more and more right now, we hear this conversation about the way that social media affects how we think about ourselves and each other. And this is a really important conversation in youth spaces. And what does it mean to be in touch with each other in meaningful ways and feel like the communication is open, that I can actually reach out to you for support and for care, and that I can offer you support and care. And that that's such a different experience from just knowing facts about each other's lives and keeping up to date. And so in this last year, we've gotten to really practice being intimate in a different way on a large scale of really sharing in our frustration. And there are still hard things in the world. So this is a skill we can take forward with us. And whatever your practices are that help you hold the complexity of community and help you stay in touch, I invite all of us to continue to face these hard things together and to know that we can still celebrate the joys in our life. There is always a light when we are ready to see it. There is always a light when we are ready to be it. To see the light, to be the light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. There is always a light when we are ready to see it. There is always a light when we are ready to be it. To see the light, to be the light, to raise our voice in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. There is always a There is always a light. When we are ready to see it, there is always a light. When we are ready to be it, to see the light, to be the light, to raise our voice in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. There is always a light. Now are you ready to be it? There is always a light. Now are you ready to see it? To be the light, to see the light, to raise our voice in the dark of night, to climb this On the Day You Are Born by Deborah Fraser. For Mother Earth, four and a half billion years old, and baby Kala, born June 1st, 1988, and for you. On the eve of your birth, word of your coming will pass from animal to animal. The reindeer will tell the Arctic terns. Who will tell the humpback whales? Who will tell the Pacific salmon? Who will tell the monarch butterflies? Who will tell the green turtles? Who will tell the European eel? Who will tell the busy garden warblers? And the marvelous news will migrate worldwide. While you wait in darkness, Tiny knees curled to chin, the earth and her creatures with the sun and the moon 
will all move into their places, each ready to greet you at the very first moment, the very first day you arrive. On the day you were born, gravity's strong pull will hold you to the earth with a promise that you will never float away while deep in space the burning sun will send up towering flames, lighting your sky from dawn to dusk. On the day you were born, the quiet moon will glow and offer to bring a full bright face each month to your windowsill. While high above the North Pole, Polaris, the glittering North Star, will stand still, shining silver light into your night sky. On the day you are born, the moon will pull on the ocean below and wave by wave, a rising tide will wash the beaches clean for your footprints. While far out at sea, clouds will swell with water drops, sail to shore on a wind, and rain you a welcome across the earth's green lands. On the day you are born, a forest of tall trees collect the sun's light in their leaves Bleh. and in silent Bleh. mystery will make oxygen for you to breathe. Turn the page. Good job. While close to your skin and as high as the sky, air will rush in and blow out, invisibly protecting you and all living things on earth. Turn the page. On the day you are born, the earth will turn, the moon will push, the sun will flare, and then with a push, you will slip out of the dark quiet where suddenly you will be able to hear I think we'll finish that in August when I'm back and you're here. How about this for now? Source of stars and planets and water and land, open our hearts to all of our neighbors, open our souls to a renewal of faith. Open our hands to join together in the work ahead. So be it, blessed be, amen.